I'm going to build a hard kernel Odroid M2 16 gigabytes to be a Bitcoin node and solo pool. But first I'm going to talk about why I chose the Odroid M2 and then do an unboxing. Finally, I'll add a couple of extras that I've bought for it. With all the economic hostility that America is showing the world, I also wanted to build something that doesn't use American technology. Hard kernel who make the Odroid are based in South Korea. The ARM CPU design is British and I plan to use Ubuntu for the OS which is also British. And lastly, I plan to use Samsung NVMe storage, which is also made in South Korea. Things that are important for a Bitcoin node and pool are compute and memory performance, especially SHA-256 performance. It is also important to be able to support 2 terabytes of SSD storage, as good seek performance is important. I asked Grok to come up with a comparison of some other products that are similar, and it chose the Raspberry Pi 5 and the Orange Pi 5 Plus. So the Rock chip um, 3588S2 is the performance chipset. So both the Orange Pi 5 and the Odroid have it. These have eight core ARM CPUs in them. The Raspberry Pi 5 has a more economic four core design. So uh, it, it doesn't win this battle. I won't be using the GPU at all, but both the Odroid and the Orange 5 have quite a good performance GPU compared to what ships in the Raspberry Pi 5. I don't need a neural processing unit for AI, but of note the Odroid and the Orange Pi 5 both have um, neural net processors in them. This is an important one. The Odroid M2 is the only one that has LP DDR5 RAM. The other two have DDR4 RAM. So the difference is this RAM can get around 50 gigabytes a second of throughput, whereas the other two can only do around 34 gigabytes a second. So if you're trying to pull data in from memory and calculate a SHA-256 hash, the Odroid M2 will pull ahead quite a bit because of the faster RAM. The Odroid has a built-in 64 gigabytes of MMC storage on board, and it also has this quite high performance HS400 controller. So that MMC storage is quite fast. Also, it's got a built-in NVMe slot on it, so you can just plug in two terabytes of SSD storage, no problems. The Raspberry Pi 5, it mostly just has a micro SD slot. And then if you want something like um, uh, NVMe, you have to buy an additional hat or an add-on board. The Orange Pi, it also has MMC built in and a micro SD. And it has actually a very high performance NVMe slot. But I don't need high performance. I just need fast seek speed. The um, uh, Odroid, it just has simple gigabit Ethernet. Of note is it doesn't have built-in Wi-Fi. If you want Wi-Fi, you've got to buy yourself a USB dongle. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 5 is quite good in this area. It's got everything, Ethernet, Wi-Fi. And the Orange Pi is screaming here. It's got dual 2.5 gig and Ethernet interfaces and Wi-Fi 6. But my data needs are very low, and I'll just be plugging in this via Ethernet. They all have a good spread of USB ports. They all have a good spread of HDMI ports. They all support PCIe. Uh, they all support Ubuntu. Uh, I'm not really too concerned about power consumption. Um, um, all of them have their own heat management. So you'll note that the uh, Odroid is slightly more expensive than the Raspberry Pi. But you've got to remember when you buy the Odroid, it comes with everything in the box, a, a case, the power supply, you don't need to buy extra hats to add storage. Um, so when I started looking at it, not only is the Raspberry Pi quite a bit slower, um, once you add in all those extra bits, it's actually quite a bit more expensive. The um, Orange Pi 5 um, is the most expensive, only slightly. Uh, and if it wasn't for the fact that it only had slow DDR4 RAM, that would have been a serious contender. But I really want the high RAM performance um, for, like, for doing fast SHA-256 calculations. This is what I got turned up. I also got myself a CR2032 battery for the real-time clock. So it doesn't forget the date and time when you power it off. And there was a special on Samsung 2TB SSD NVMe. So I got myself one of these as well. All right, let's see what was what's in the box. Uh, there'll be the main Odroid box itself. We'll open that up in just a second. Power supply. I'm in New Zealand, so an Australian plug. All right, let's have a closer look at some of these. Let's rip out this power supply. All 
and it just has a universal fitting so we'll get that out so that makes things super easy I don't know how well that close shows up on the camera but there's an open and a lock setting so you just slide that in and then you just twist it to lock it all right that's the power supply all done let's get the odroid box itself opened up So as expected, it ships in a case. We can see our NVM, sorry, our USB ports, HDMI, more USB power, Ethernet. Some kind of switch there, not sure. Oh, I think that might be to select between what type of internal storage to use for booting. And that will be the USB-C. Um, oh, it must be able to be powered by USB-C, but the power supply I've got is a bullet style power adapter. Uh, let's see what sort of size is this so it's about it's kind of just a little bit under a hundred mils so um, the whole box is actually quite tiny and you can see inside of it that it's got a active fan for cooling and I'm guessing that's the NVMe slot okay I'm just going to figure out how to open this thing up so we can have a look inside of it on the side of the switch it's got these push in tabs to release open the case um, the case is closed quite firmly so I'll do this off camera because you need to sort of push them all down to get it open okay I've got this thing to pop out so we'll just open this up let's have a look at the bottom of this board so that's obviously for the real-time clock battery and that'll be for the NVMe storage all right let me go grab the battery and we'll get it loaded in These batteries are always so hard to get into. So much for easy open. I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but there's a little label that says RTC battery there. The battery installation is not completely obvious to me. This side here has got a bit of a hook, and that one's got a, a flat bit, so that must go to the bottom of the battery. So I think the battery is meant to be installed this way around. So we'll have a go at popping it in. So fingers crossed that is correct. Let's just have a look around the board and see what else we see. Okay, over here I can see some text that says UART. What do we got on the other side? So that uh, there's text labeled DC, oh, let's turn it around. So it says DC jack here, so it's the power input. And it's got USB 3 written in text there. Uh, and that's just the HDMI ports again. Let's see, hard kernel. Oh, that switch we found before. It says EMMC or micro SD. I don't see the micro. Oh, that must be meant to be the. Oh, there's a micro SD slot there as well. So you must be able to select between using the built in memory and the memory um, and an external micro SD card. Uh, we've got a little thing here saying MIPI DSI. So you've got a little tiny connector there. And I see on the back we've got a connector over here as well. Not sure what that's uh, for. I can't see a label. All right. Oh, let's pop the NVMe storage in while we're here. Uh, it's obvious now. Look at the back of it. This is the NVMe storage. So that's obviously the PCI slot for the NVMe to go into. All right. Let's get the screw out of here. Let's get our NVMe drive out. Right, let's chuck in our NVMe storage. So in my case, this is going to be used for storing the blockchain on. But um, if you're just using this for a general compute device, you might be storing other data on here. That little screw back in again. Oh, all right. Let me just do this off camera. All right, that's got that started. I can finish putting that in. Okay, so I got my battery for my real-time clock, my storage. And I think we need to put this back in its case. Just for lining this up, the uh, Odroid's got this power button on it, and you've got this little power button in the case. So those two need to line, those two need to line up. So that tells you which way around to put it. Plus, it becomes obvious of all the uh, holes then lining up. All right, fingers crossed. I've got everything located, and it'll just all snap back together. Oh no, that can't be right because that's blocking that piece. All right, let's try turning it around.
Hopefully this will just snap back together. All right, I think, yep, I think that's all back, all back together. All right, let's go and get this powered up and see what it looks like to set up. Okay, just quickly coming back here. When I just plugged it in, I couldn't get it to boot initially, and I had to switch this, move the switch across to the right-hand position, the EMMC position. I don't know how it shipped now, or maybe I bumped it, but if you can't get it to boot, just check out that switch. So I've plugged in a keyboard, HDMI uh, monitor, Ethernet, and uh, last thing is the um, DC plug. I notice as soon as you plug it in, it boots immediately. It doesn't wait for me to press the power button. So I'll just plug that in and off camera. Okay, you get a few blue, uh, red and blue flashing lights. And then I get this up on the screen asking me to install an OS. So I can choose Android, Ubuntu Gnome Desktop, or Ubuntu Server. So I'm going to choose Ubuntu Server. And that's asking me where I want to install it. Uh, that's my NVMe, so I'm just going to use the built-in 64 gig drive for the boot and keep the other one for data. And now it looks like it's flashing it. Okay, we'll come back to it when it's a bit further through. I also note that it's uh, Ubuntu 2004 and 2404. I'll probably let this process complete, but then I'll go and download Ubuntu 24 and we'll reflash this again. I'd rather just use the latest version of Ubuntu Server. Okay, so we've got a note that it's correctly flashed it, asking us to reboot, so let's say yes and let it reboot. Painless so far. Okay, and we've come to the server login. Let me go hit Google and just see what the uh, default username and password is. Google says the default username and password is Odroid and Odroids. So we'll give those two a try. Yep, that seems to have worked just fine. What's it telling us here? We've got our drive usage, memory usage, swap usage, all the IP addresses. Well, lots of software updates that you can apply. Uh, maybe let's look at a quick command like top. Uh, let's ask top to display all the CPUs. All right, there's, there's all eight CPU cores. All right, this works really good. All right, let's go and explore what's required to get onto Ubuntu 2404. I was just replying all the updates and it looks like it's got the do release upgrade command. So maybe I'll try this method and see if I can get this to upgrade it automatically to, um, oh, let's try it without Y. Uh, to upgrade automatically without having to download the new release separately. All right, I'll come back at the end when this is done. Okay, so that process complete and rebooted. We're now on Ubuntu 2204. So I'm going to try repeating that process to see if I can get up to 2404. Okay, let's switch over to SSH because it's just a bit easier for the camera recording. So that upgrade completed okay. So the Odroid which is this left-hand one, is now running um, 2404, just how I want it. I thought it might be interesting to do a little performance benchmark. So I've got an exist, my existing um, Intel compute box I'm using, so I thought we might try running a performance test. Now the 7-zip tool, which is really popular on most platforms, has a benchmarking command in it. So if you go 7-zip-b, it'll run as a benchmark. So let's try running a benchmark on these two platforms and just see how the performance of the new uh, little baby Odroid compares to the um, existing Intel one. So the existing Intel one, you can see it's an Intel i3-6100 running at 3.2 gigahertz. Uh, won't tell us the individual CPU frequencies, and we can see it's running at 2.3 gigahertz over here, but we have uh, eight cores. And it's testing um, compression and decompression throughput, so this is a very hard on the CPU test. So it's most of the way through the test now. We'll let it go a bit more. I think there's one more line after this one. Yep, there we go. So we'll start looking at this side. So this first column here is measuring the memory speed. So basically it's reading 9,000 kilobytes a second. So what's that, 9 megabytes a second here on the Intel. And it's managing to write around 100 megabytes a second, something like that. So on the Odroid, we can see we've gone from um, 9,000 to 14,000, uh, 16,000. 
So that's um, significantly faster reading memory. Uh, writing memory here, it's sort of bouncing around 199, 200. So double the speed writing. Uh, now this number here is the but a measure of how many instructions per second it, it was able to run. So the MIPS rating. So uh, if we go to the Intel, it was able to do 9,800 MIPS. What's that? Is that 9.8 billion instructions per second? And this just absolutely hosed it doing uh, 17,000 or 17, um, yeah, 17,000 MIPS. So that was doing the compression and writing, uh, sorry, decompressing. It was able to do 8,800 MIPS and over here, uh, 17,000. So the, that new little uh, Odroid M2 is considerably faster at compute than my uh, existing HP um, i3 node that I'm using at the moment. Now in the Odroid uh, forum, so you notice how I had to do uh, like two or three release upgrades. I see they also have Ubuntu 2404 simply available for download for the M2. Um, I won't do it on this video, but I think rather than uh, having it gone through so many release cycles, I think I'll probably just download the latest Ubuntu 2404 and just flash that in one hit so it's got a nice clean install. So I hope you like taking a look at what the Odroid M2 is capable of. It certainly appears to be a very fast box. It's very cost competitive at the price. You get everything in the box ready to go. If you've got a compute intensive task like I've got for uh, let's say a Bitcoin node and pull, I think it'll be well suited to the task. And it looks like there's no compromises whatsoever by choosing not to use any American technology in the solution. So I hope you found that interesting. I'm going to make some other videos uh, more specific back to Bitcoin again rather than hardware about actually setting up the node and the pool for solo mining. So if that kind of thing is your thing, um, stay around and watch some more videos. Thanks for watching.